a global chapter uh, uh, distribution mechanism. So this is the Colorado chapter. We have now about 45 chapters around the world. We're working on some in Australia. We're working on some in Africa. And so the goal really is to have a chapter on every continent with the exception of Antarctica. Everyone always points out to me. Um, uh, by the end of the year. And uh, so we're growing nicely and we're scaling and it seems like we're doing some good. So I would, I would encourage you to pass the word. And if you have not signed up on our Facebook channel, uh, we're at uh, Facebook slash soapnet.org. I mean soapnet. And on our LinkedIn group. So we presently have about approaching 30,000 people on the LinkedIn site. And the website, the, the Facebook thing is scaling fairly quickly. So if you want to stay in touch with what's going on, that's how you do it. So thanks again for uh, joining us and, and uh, your membership. So quickly, I want to go around the room and just briefly, 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 briefly introduce <laughs> yourself. Uh, don't give us the pitch, just your name and what you do, uh, so we can let everybody know who's here. Hi, I'm Don Pretty. I have a consulting business to help me practice. Yay, good. John. I'm John Kimber from Australia. We do clinical trials down under and we raise money for startups and small US companies that are looking to raise money to do bioscience research. David Longini, I have my own Salesforce consulting company focused on field sales and field service, which overlaps with health with home health care, medical device, anybody who has to go out and install, repair, and maintain equipment. Yeah, and I'll introduce the folks. Uh, <clears throat> um, Eddie Crew, business development manager with uh, Synec and Computer Network Services. We specialize in uh, level of compliance where they are in the uh, uh, private practice positions. So. Uh, Antonio Went, CEO, Synec and Network and Computer Services. We do uh, private practice HIPAA compliance network for private practice positions. Yeah, Shannon, you can introduce yourself. Okay, hi, I'm Shannon O'Neill. I'm actually um, part of Contract RX, uh, who's presenting today. I'm glad to be here. I've been here a few times. Thank you, Arlen. I'm looking forward to hearing Ramon's talk. Um, but my background is uh, working with uh, sort of VC side uh, startups, and I'm real interested on the legal and growth side of that industry. So ask me questions if you've got them. Thanks for hosting the event. I'm a neurohormonologist scientist at Anschutz. And we work on pain studies, anesthetics, and the drug. I'm Megan Van Buren. I am, and I'm starting an early stage startup in pain management space. Uh, Les Simpson, VIP Health here. We do two things. Number one, we eliminate the out of pocket for people going to doctors, and second, we're getting doctors out of the insurance companies. Uh, Less sensitive VIP healthcare lifetime. Greg Ogle, Bonaire Nasal Moisturizing Lotion, which has made Mitch McConnell so happy that next week he's going to actually crack a smile and tell a joke. <laughs> Carol Wood, the Ponsidine Group. We help people rapidly increase their revenue without selling and navigate the future of employment. Thank you. Michelle Thompson, um, background in banking and insurance. Recently, I started consulting, mainly focused on helping businesses increase their effectiveness through relational skills. Mm -hmm. Flow Lottery, Aspen Commercial Lending. We are a commercial lender, so ground up construction, anything in the real estate space and in the medical space, we help medical practices to refinance debt, um, pay off debt, buy out practices, all of it. My name is John Molesky, I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Colorado Allergy and Asthma, and we have 12 locations in the you know, patient base. Hello, I'm John Hammer, I specialize in infectious diseases, for medical medicine, and looking for options uh, beyond clinical medicine. Thank you. 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 Shannon, we're all trying to 
trying to get stuff going on. So just here when this group is alive and well. Good morning, I'm Berlin Sardar. I'm co-founder of Cloud Privacy Labs. We uh, focus on data privacy. We have Consent Grid, which provides consent and privacy control to data flow. And we are about to launch our platform to help companies to respond to the California Consumer Privacy Act. Uh, Aaron Connell, uh, financial planner. Um, we help physicians, attorneys um, navigate uh, their student loans and, and build a financial base for the future. Thank you. Good morning, I'm James Lowry, co-founder of Concept to Exit. We find companies that are trying to commercialize products that have money and problems they can't solve for. Money is critical, we take their money and solve their problems. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Bob Moog. I'm with the Concept to Exit Consulting Group. My name is MJ, I'm in the mental health field. I'm a consultant with attorneys in dependency, neglect, and um, child and family cases. I'm also a, a professor at DU in the School of Social Work. Good morning, my name is Christina De Herrera. I'm here from the United States Patent and Trademark Office, Rocky Mountain Regional Office here in Denver. Um, we just wanted to make you all aware that we are a resource that's available to everybody um, here in the area. We plan on doing some more stuff together, so we look forward to seeing you again. Uh, so if you have specific questions or needs, about patents and trademarks, parentheses, not copyrights, because they don't do that stuff. If you have patents, you know who does copyright? Library of Congress. Library of Congress. So if, good for you, so you can get another cup of coffee. No, if you have a question about needs and how it all works, and these guys are great. They have an enormous amount of resources in the regional office and education and education. So we need to know from you what we can do together to help solve your problem. So thanks for showing up, yeah, Carl. I design stage and manage capital campaigns, specializing in opportunity zones. I help you find people who love you more than you love yourself. <laughs> wow. Uh, Michael Steen just moved here from Columbus, Ohio. Started four businesses and also was in banking for 35 years. Wallace Stromberg, I'm a healthcare attorney with Hall Render, the national firm that only represents people in the healthcare sector. So we do all sorts of business and regulatory matters. I primarily work with providers and small businessmen in the business sector of healthcare. Hi, good morning. My name is Brandon Kelly with Quantum Media LLC, here with Anthony today, helping to live stream. Um, I do videography and photography for businesses and entrepreneurs. Kelly Senholtz, emergency medicine, serial entrepreneur, medicine, technology, real estate. My name is Bernard Zurich. I'm a radiologist. We provide teleradiology services and are looking to move into imaging center uh, operations. I'm a Donny Lazzari. I am a marketing consultant. Uh, when, when a client needs to manage their programs, I function as a fractional VP of marketing, or whatever title they want to give me. Usually as custodian. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So the usual room full with uh, high powered people. So this session uh, uh, came about. Uh, because, as with most of what we do, we're, we're trying to identify problems that need a solution. And in this case, my experience and maybe yours is that when startup entrepreneurs, co-founders, whatever, engage people like you to be advisors, consultants, chief medical officer, board of directors, management team, anybody that's sort of engaged with the business, there is a gap in understanding of what that entails. So specifically when David says to me, Arlen, I want you to be a, a consultant or an advisor to my company, the, what I'm going to say is, well, what do you want me to do? And then uh, how much are you going to pay me? Because I come from the James Lowry School of we take your money to do good things. <laughs> so, but the first question really is, what do you want me to do and, and serve in what role? And so that typically leads to, well, send me a service ag advisory agreement. And the typical answer I get is, what's that? Or can you send me a template? Or have you done this before and maybe you can send me an agreement that you've already signed? 
so that's and it's a two-sided gap. So the advisor um, really doesn't have has doesn't know what they're asking for, and the advisee doesn't know what they're getting themselves into. So you wind up with bad feelings, bills that don't get paid, blah 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 blah, and it just spirals downhill and just a wasted effort. So these folks are going to present you with an approach to a solution, and I thought it would be useful to present it in front of the group. So, <coughs> Jaren, if you want to introduce the speaker, um, then um, uh, we can leave some time for questions, but thanks again for hosting it, and we look forward to your presentation. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so I am one of the other Shannons with uh, Contracts RX. Um, we come up with a solution we're trying to solve through technology. Um, the uh, conundrum of contracting more quickly um, and uh, and without um, without necessarily as much of a heavy services component. Um, this is Ramon Rhines, and he is uh, the founder of uh, Contracts RX. We just recently rebranded, so you'll see some red line solutions on some things, but um, but it all all the contact information still works, and um, he's both an attorney and has. Um, you know, over 25 years of experience in negotiating contracts and, um, and also has a background in uh, technology. Thank you, and thank you all for being here today. Um, just by a show of hands, how many people when they came in actually gave Arlen a kiss? <laughs> <laughs> That's all? So a woman uh, went in front of me to, to kiss him and I thought, is he, you know, is he going to be gender biased? Uh, <laughs> and he wasn't. I can tell you, and, uh, and if you haven't done so, it's a refreshing experience. <laughs> so, and I um, did wash my hands before I did it. All good. <laughs> so, um, so how many people, just here as a level setting exercise, are actually um, physicians? Uh, so um, looking at that, yeah, I want to say a good 20%. And then how many people provide services to physicians and the medical industry. And so here's an interesting point that I think uh, physicians that have been practicing for more than seven years already get. And that is that physicians are highly, highly skilled information professionals on a fee-for-service basis that unlock economics for other people. You can't really scale the fee-for-service model, but you can scale a lot of businesses around it, and hence the need for entrepreneurship inside of this space, because the way that the rules are set up and the way that the physicians have to practice and the investment that they make in order to do this business makes it very, very difficult to actually do the business. Anybody know how much money we're spending in healthcare in the United States, just off the top of your head? Just in all of healthcare 3. services. 7. Yeah, 3.7 trillion. 3.7 trillion now, right? And just last year and the year before, I mean, hundreds of millions less. So it's not only a large, incredible number, $3.7 trillion, a little bit, I think, around 17, 18% of the U.S. economy. But it's also at its rate continuing to grow, which, of course, is just We've got all that money out there, and the one folks that actually can actually make a difference inside of it aren't really making any money in that industry because the physicians don't make the money on the, on the trillions of dollars that are going there. That's not where the money is made. Any idea of what you think the number one cost driver is in the healthcare system in the United States? Pharmaceuticals, Pharmaceuticals would be my guess. That's what I would think as well, right? Just give me something to take Legal. for it. Legal, oh gosh. Those guys have got to go out of it. But definitely not legal and definitely not malpractice and not those things. It's not the elderly. It's not women. It's not children. It's technology. Technology is the number one cost driver in our healthcare system. You get a new whiz-bang machine. And unlike in other areas where every two years you buy an awesome machine, it gets half price or it actually stays the same price, except for Apple phones. They seem to just go up exorbitantly. <laughs> But Moore's law doesn't appear to apply for technology and healthcare. It's kind of crazy. Healthcare technology, and of course, when we think about technology, we think about entrepreneurship. So we're finding, we're really at the cusp, of course, we have been for some time, of finding new and better ways of delivering the healthcare 
Um, gosh, the healthcare problem in the United States. I would submit to you that we actually don't have a healthcare system in the United States. We have a healthcare reimbursement system. We have a terrific way of moving money in the United States for healthcare, but not a really terrific healthcare system, which we is why. We actually don't have a healthcare system. We have a sick care sick system care. of systems. This is a, uh, I, I, I should have known to, to, to step lightly in this area with saying, let me share with you my limited opinion on what's wrong with healthcare. <laughs> I come out of the claims world, out of the insurance side, so I see the ills of what they come from. Uh, technology, I have done uh, practicing law inside of healthcare technology on the claims licensing area for, gosh, probably about over 10, 12 years now, and uh, can definitely see where all the money is, um, but not necessarily where all the solutions are. So entrepreneurship inside of this space is long in coming. A um, lot of barriers to entry entrepreneurship when you're a physician. You've just spent a decade of your life investing in a lot of, um, uh, a lot of time and energy and money, to, uh, obviously, to get educated in what you're doing and to become a practitioner. And when you then get into practice and you recognize the fee-for-service model doesn't scale, it's very difficult to pivot. It's, it's difficult to pivot out of that. Organizations like so, uh, and the support industry around entrepreneurship probably isn't ever, it's, it's not it's not as strong as, as it's ever been the way it is now. The strength of the support that you get for entrepreneurship is enormous. And SOAP is a big driving factor for that. So I really appreciate being here to speak. Today we're going to talk about specifically the risky business around uh, investors, contracting with investors and advisors, but particularly on the advisor side. We'll talk a little bit about investors and advisors, but particularly on the advisor side. And the, uh, and the advisor agreement. So the first part is who's who. So um, when we think about what an investor does, right, very basically, an investor wants to buy part of your company for a really cheap price because there's high risk, right? And so if you know you're sitting on a billion-dollar company, of course, but it's not worth a billion dollars the day you start, you know, an investor coming in and buying some of your shares early on, well, that's probably not a bad deal for them. You're buying on the They're looking for a high return on investment, the close market fit for your products, you're solving a problem that they think should be solved and that they can make money off of. Um, also for founders that appear to be confident, capable, and trustworthy uh, that are able to deliver a product or service that sells. And between a product and service, investors like to invest in which one? Products or service companies? Products. products. And why products? You can scale them. Because you can scale a product. You can't scale the hours in a day. So really when you're thinking about investors, you're thinking about investing in early stage product companies. The advisor, on the other hand, sort of a friend for service in the beginning. It's kind of a, gosh, who do I know that can help me with this particular problem? Or what is it that an advisor does for me? Why do I even need an advisor? Uh, these folks provide a service to your company. That's the very important piece. Arlen touched on that in the beginning. They are service providers. As advisors, we are service providers. And it somehow gets lost in translation when you think about an advisor agreement. You think, oh, it's my advisor. It's a service company. Uh, it's for a period of time, and they get paid to do it. That's really, uh, that's really how the advisor part works, which means that you know, if you have a company uh, that has 100 advisors and you're giving 1% you know, of your company away to each advisor, well, then you're pretty much done. You don't have anything left in your company past the advisor stage. So you have to think about what we're paying for. So why do we need an advisor? And the disclaimer here is that this photo does not show a picture of an attorney. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, the, Founders actually do need specialized information in order to create their company. The amount of things that we need to know these days to start a company, to actually function a company, is enormous, and you're not going to know it all. But you have to have resources to get to it. Some of those resources are free. Some of them aren't. Um, when we're looking, at, looking for advisors, a company might look for an advisor in order to help um, connect to sales channels or to connect with relevant investors. Definitely the role when you're starting out that can help unlock certain opportunities. And those opportunities and then unlocking, that's really worth the value of paying an advisor to do. Company promotion, industry name recognition. I don't know if anybody has heard of the group MediaLink out in California. I'm forgetting Mike's last name, the guy that runs that. He is uh, sort of the godfather over there with uh, uh, advertising and in the advertising field. And so you hire his company to go and introduce you to folks, and they listen to him. 
So he's a terrific opportunity of industry name recognition. Finally, um, filling out an early stage team. You know, when it's you and a colleague that you're starting with, there's only two of you for a team, it's hard to get the credibility when you're going after a larger client. And so sometimes you'll say, here's our team, and you'll add advisor photos as well to make your team look larger, but also to understand that you're not just, you know, a couple of folks out of a garage. So these are some of the reasons why you might get uh, some advisors. The advisor agreement, like any other agreement, pretty straightforward for lawyers, maybe not so much for other folks. Mm -hmm. Offer, consideration, and acceptance. These are the three things that make up a contract. Pretty basic. Uh, the advisor is promising to do something for you, and you're counter-promising. The advisor says, I'm going to consult with you for a period of time, any agreement. I'm going to create connections for you, possibly. I'm going to help on ideating your products and services. More about ideating here later, kind of an interesting subject. You promise, on the other hand, to pay that advisor something, right? You're going to pay them. Typically, when you're cash strapped, when you're first starting out, it's a percentage of the company. It's some sort of shares of the inside of the company. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, compensation later. Uh, and then an option, it could either be shares in the company or options to purchase company uh, shares at a lower price. And then finally, and the most important piece, of course, is to write it down. This is very important. Early stage companies often make mistakes in this area. That is, we don't write our contracts down. We actually don't have a written agreement. And so we end up having a lot of verbal agreements and a lot of hard conversations around what we may have promised. So let me ask you a couple of questions at this point. Is an oral agreement a contract? Yeah, it absolutely is. It's a terrific, uh, it is such a terrific question. An oral agreement is absolutely a contract. Uh, the question is how enforceable would it be? And so when we think about a contract, by definition, it's an exchange of promises that's enforceable in the courts. Um, how many of you think like, like cases ever really get to the courts anymore? Like do we even go to court anymore? Just the threat of going to court helps the enforceability, and that raises the cost. Oral arguments themselves, really tricky to enforce because we lose what the promises were. You promised that you said this, and you promised to do that. And so what happens then, if it does go to court, is that you have to prove what the contract was. And how do you prove an oral statement? But you see the actions that happened afterward. So in a typical exchange, um, again, Someone asked me to do this. How detailed does it have to be in writing? Can it be, Arlen, I want to ask, I want, I'm offering you to be an advisor. I'm offering you $100 a day to do it and uh, sign this. And it's an email. And I say, thanks, I accept. Or I don't eat, and that's the other issue, you know, what's an acceptance? So let's just, let's forget that for the time being. But let's just say, I agree, thanks for asking me to work for your company. In a, th in a three sentence email. Yes. Is that an enforceable contract? Absolutely. So if somebody sends you an email and says, I want you to do this and I promise to pay you X, Y, and Z. And you write back and say, okay, we've had the offer. Person said, look, I want you to do this for me and I'll pay you. you we've had the acceptance, you've written it down in an email. Since the Clinton administration, emails are, in fact, uh, part of contracts. So at that point, you do have a contract. And the question is, do we have the terms all, uh, all inside of that? Is there some question about what the scope or what the terms were? But that's definitely an enforceable okay, contract. Okay, so that's my next question. So then, typically, the person wanting you to work for them wants to put as many paragraphs in the advisory agreement yes. as possible. Yes. Like you get a 17-page legal ease, yes. blah, 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 yes. versus the advisor who yeah. wants as few constraints <laughs> as possible. possible. That's right. So I want a three-sentence yeah. email that says, yeah. Arlen, we're going to hire you. Yeah. You send back a 17-page, obviously written by a lawyer document yes. or template from Hyatt, yes. from Hyatt Legal Services yes. that outlines everything from soup to nuts. Yes. What should the advisor do in that situation? We're going to touch a little bit more about scope and about what the right balance is a little bit later inside of the presentation, including compensation. This is a common question. This is part of what sort of drove the value prop for what we do at Contracts Rx. There are some contracts that are, that are not worth the value that it takes to actually review them. Mm -hmm. 
So you've got like a, it's a, it's a $200 or $5,000 gig, but it's going to cost you $10,000 to review the contract and make sure that you're not getting hosed. We see an awful lot of that. We have to simplify our contracts. And how do we actually do that is through templates. And if you have a template, how do you use it? We'll talk a little bit more about that here in a couple more slides. Absolutely. That's a very difficult question. It would make me look bad to say so, so I'm going to give it to Shannon or the other Shannon. <laughs> uh, you can absolutely pick their brains. Uh, MOUs are interesting. It's an interesting uh, um, memorandum of understanding, a letter of agreement, all of these things. The question is, does that constitute a contract? When do you actually have a contract? Or a letter of intent. Those are some of my favorites, letter of intents. Some of my favorites. One more question in relation. How is an oral contract a contract without consideration? It is not. One of the key elements for a contract is you've got to have consideration. And what is consideration? It's just an exchange of promises. So in Arlen's example, when the person said, look, I want to hire you. I want, to, I want you to come and speak for us, and, uh, and I'll pay you $100. All the consideration is there. He's going to get $100 in exchange for it. It doesn't mean you have to pay me the hundred dollars at that moment. You're just making a promise to pay me a hundred dollars. That's a very key piece, and that's why we underline the concept of promises. It's just an exchange of promises. An executed contract is a contract where all the work has already been done and the promises have been exchanged. Not a signed contract. There's a little bit of a misnomer there. Signing a contract means yep. I accept. Uh, executing a contract or an executed contract is a contract where all performance has been completed. You've been paid the money, you perform the service. The other, the other issue that you'll run into if, you're, if, if you do your job correctly is you will be subcontracted. So you start out with a startup, two people in a basement with a patent on the wall that says, I have no money and I want you to do blah, 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 and I either say yes or no. Two, a major biopharmaceutical company who subcontracts your services to someone, you know, to do something else, or a third party intermediary that is working for a biopharmaceutical or a medical device company that then contracts me to do stuff for them to do stuff for the big cheese. Now, when you get into that value chain and that food chain, you can expect a very long advisory service agreement. And, and you can expect oodles of paperwork and non-disclosures and due diligence and <laughs> filling out all sorts of forms on yeah. the website. Yeah. I dare you to be a consultant to a major biopharmaceutical company. Yep. <laughs> it's real heartburn. Now, yeah. it's, it depends to, in, to you whether it's worth it or not. I mean, ultimately, whether you do this depends on the value of the engagement to you, tangibly and intangibly, versus the compensation. Yep. Is the brain damage and the work simply worth it based on what you're promising to pay me or compensate me? And compensation, incidentally, does, in a lot of cases, does not include cash. It's yes. either cash, equity, or both. Yep. So just a couple of points for you to, and finally, and maybe you'll get into this, if you are the contract or or the contract E, there are significant tax and liability issues based that result from the promise. Warrants, stock options, all that stuff. So before you get involved with this, you really need to have a financial advisor, an accountant, a bank, you know, somebody that understands the implication because you could wind up paying taxes on shares that are worth nothing. Yeah, all kinds of stuff. So that, that's why we're presenting this. So yeah. heads up, get the right people to inform you and make an informed decision. Yeah. But isn't that, Arlen, isn't that why you do a memorandum of understanding before we do a contract? In other words, let's date before we get married, so to speak. Well, let's talk about that. Um, so let me get through the contract portion of it, and then we can see where maybe a memorandum of understanding or uh, a letter of intent get you close but aren't bringing you into this realm yet. So, um, so we've got a basic advisor contract scope here. We've got scope, we've got compensation, and then we've got something signed or some sort of a acceptance of that in this part of the story. Um, the key terms inside of an agreement for um, an advisor agreement, 
that help both the advisors and the company retaining the advisors are really around the scope of services. And so to Arlen's question, how deep do we have to go into specifics? I can tell you that the number one problem in every contract that's a services contract is this, it's the scope of services. We have not specified what the scope of services are. I either, uh, if it was not uh, detailed enough, then the advisor ends up saying, well, I didn't say I was going to do that, and there's a, a not a meeting of the minds, or vice versa. Hey, uh, you didn't say you wouldn't do that, so I can compel you to do that. And um, so the scope of services part is probably the one area to really focus on. A couple of areas that are also, of course, exceedingly important. Compensation, the duration, some of the things like assignment of work product, working for that biopharmaceutical company or technology company and you're an advisor, you can bet that they're going to want you to assign away anything that you create because that's the whole point. They're an early stage company and the only thing they own is their technology or their intellectual property. So you'd be, you'd be uh, signing away you know, intellectual property rights with regard to anything that you created during the duration of your, uh, your uh, advisory services. A couple of other areas. Uh, uh, yes, the mystery number one provision that you should have. I was waiting for someone who had to leave at the half an hour, and then I would say what that secret was, but she said she didn't want to miss it, and I just <laughs> wanted to be mean. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a number one contract provision that we're going to talk about, uh, and I'm actually going to try and pull you and see what you, you think. think. What do you believe out of every contract that you've ever seen? What do you think, by a show of hands, well, actually, just throw out the, 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 your, your thoughts. The number one contract provision that you should always pay attention to, like it's the number one contract provision. Any ideas? Contract. Length, Length, duration, that's a great idea. Breach of contract. Breach of contract, and that's spelled out. Another great idea. What's another one? Limitation. Oh, of course. And it's always the attorney that knows. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, the answer is, I'm not going to tell you. No, it's termination provisions. Yeah, absolutely. When we have breach, if we have a way to terminate early, I'm good. I don't have to go through the breach argument. Duration, I have to wait two years. This terrible relationship for another two years. Or uh, for, the, for the folks that have actually acquired the advisor, we have to give them 1% of the company and they're not doing anything over a two-year period. Termination is the actual most important thing in any arrangement. And as my colleague knows, the reason why termination is important when things are going well, no one reads the contract. But when things are going poorly, you read the contract and you want to get out of it. So it really is, oh, I want to get out provision. So um, it seems kind of odd to say I'm excited to create a contract. It's one of the funniest things is creating contracts. We're all excited when we get into them. Um, and we have to prepare for getting out of them. And the termination provision is, in my opinion, and I think my colleague shares that opinion, is the number one contract provision that you should pay attention to. And, and to answer sort of your question, I, I typically, and I don't know how everybody else does this, and I'm interested in how you do it, but I think it's a good idea to build in the divorce before you How do you walk before you run, particularly in startups, particularly in situations where neither side really understands what they're getting themselves into? particularly in situations where you really don't know you can deliver what the person is hiring you to do. A typical example is raising money. So not infrequently. A startup will come, not just me, but people like you and say, Carl, I want you to connect me to your Rolodex and raise $500,000 for our seed round. And they think Carl's a pretty good guy and knows how to do this, but guess what? He can't or the people he asked aren't interested, whatever. There's a million reasons. You just never know. So what I propose is, I'm going to do this for a month. We're going to agree to work together for a month. Kind of like a pilot. And it's a pilot. It's, it's your first date at Starbucks. And after a month, you tell me whether you want to renew or renegotiate the agreement. And there, then there's no hard feelings. Like, OK, I gave it my best shot. I couldn't meet your objective. Thank you very much for what you paid me for that month. We're OK. And you know what? Usually it's the world is a round place. And when you get to a different place, you come back to me and you say, you know, I'm in a different place. I want to use you again, whatever. That's the point. But my advice, and most advisors, you rent. You do not buy. Rent. 
rent. In other words, you don't want to sell them the company because now they're an owner. You want to rent them. In other words, you pay them money for a period of time, as I just said, and then you can decide where's the value on both sides. Because my agenda may change. You hire me, I do it for a month. A month later, Lowry offers me you know, $500,000 to work for his company. It's happened. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to work for you anymore because I'm laddering my commitment. Yeah. I want to work for the highest yield commitment. Yeah. And if you're at the bottom of the ladder, it's like a bond ladder. I want to rotate the bond to a higher interest rate. So I'm going to do the same thing with, a, with an advisory portfolio. So there's lots of ways to play this thing. And finally, the contract is worth the, isn't worth the paper it's written on. It's the, people you, it's the it. people you sign it with. So I don't care how many pages of gobbledygook you send me. If I don't like you and I don't want to work and I don't trust you, I don't care what you send me. I'm not doing it. Yep. Well, I think to your point there, though, is having been in the merchant acquisition space, it's a very difficult concept for early stage businesses to understand how much more expensive equity is today. Right? And, that, and so in that stage, when they're saying, let's rent, let's start dating, we can't pay you yet, but we'll give you shares. Right. And that's a common piece because they, they don't realize how expensive that is or versus yeah. let's pay out of pocket for that month. And realize. so right. your point specifying as the advisor, this is a month agreement. You can afford that because you right. have to. And, oh, and oh, by the way, when someone says we can't afford to pay you, yes, you can. You just don't want to. <laughs> but that's because they don't understand yeah. the concept. Yeah, right. Because Particularly right. if it's a month, say, right. Here's some worthless paper yeah. that we all know is worth something. Well, no, absolutely. Look, the other part of it also is it's an allocation of risk. So from the entrepreneurial's perspective, cash is, you know, the, the uncertainty around cash flow is enormous. And so they think, hmm, this is an investment that I'm making. Will this investment yield something? If the entrepreneur can use paper, fully dilutable paper, why not? They're giving you currency from the bank of their company, right? And so it makes sense to them in the short term. Of course, in the long term, it gets a little tricky. Very difficult for advisors to have 15 companies that they're advising for and, and have you know, you know, a quarter of a percent of share in each one of these companies. Right? You, can't, you can't pay your own mortgage with that, of course, also. And so, what, are your, what are your feelings about soap? And I hate to just keep going on and on, no, but I want to get these things out. Um, what do you think about, for example, safe agreements? So a safe agreement is a simplified agreement for future <clears throat> equity, SAFE. It was concocted by Y Combinator, this big deal startup accelerator in the coast. And it was, a, it was designed to address this problem. How, what do you go, what's the contract in plain English? What do you want me to do? How are you going to compensate me? What are the expectations? But it does not, it's a page. It's a page and a half. You can download it on the internet. Yep. So how does that jive with all these all the legalese that the lawyers want versus yeah. the simplification that I want. Yeah. So, uh, so there's definitely a balance. There are some very key terms that uh, an entrepreneur must have, in my opinion. There's also uh, terms that the advisor would like to have as well. We're going to touch on a couple of them. In fact, you can see them up here. So, for example, we want to make sure that we've got confidentiality, right? If, uh, if you are speaking with an advisor and the advisor's got the ability to share everything that they've spoken with you to others, that's kind of a problem for the, for the company. But we've also got this concept of, oh gosh, a non-compete would be kind of risky, right? That's risky for the advisor. But you can also see that if the entrepreneur is paying money for your services for a period of time, they don't want you to take your services and your knowledge and maybe support a competitive uh, outfit, especially in the early stage. And so I don't think the SAFE agreement deals with a number of these things. I also don't think that the SAFE agreement necessarily handles scope effectively. That said, if you know the common areas or the checklist of items that you actually need to look for, it almost doesn't matter what agreement you use. You just want to make sure that it's there, right? And the trick with the advisor agreement, the trick with anything, is that you're not a repeat player unless you're the advisor. If you're the advisor, you are the repeat player. And it definitely behooves the advisor to create a contract for yourselves if you're going to be doing this in, uh, as a service offering and make it simple and make sure that all the big buckets are, are, uh, are uh, checked off so that when you give that advisor agreement to the other party, they can read it, they get it, and that there's no 
striping process. Because that's the one thing that I think irks everybody. If it takes too long to get into contracting, then we're wasting our time, because no one gets paid at the MOU uh, or the LOI stage. Um, first point on an MOU, you can spend an awful lot of time paying an attorney to draft an MOU. There's no money on it. It's just, it's like a preterm sheet. There's nothing enforceable about it. And in fact, can be often dangerous on the other side because it introduces information that you're likely going to need to keep confidential. So you're taking on a burden and you're not getting paid. What about the pre-step, which is, Arlen, before we do any of this, I want you to sign a CDA or an ND, a confidential yeah. disclosure agreement or a non-disclosure agreement. Yeah, these are almost fodder. Uh, they're just table stakes these days. I would not actually have anybody resist signing an NDA. And the reason for that is because, uh, provided that the scope of the NDA is limited to the conversations that you're having with them, you're in good shape. Like, this is just the kind of stuff that it's a check the box exercise that early stage companies have to have. If they're going to go for larger money, uh, the folks that are giving them money want to make sure that they own what they're giving money for. And so it's a pedigree type of a thing that you actually have to, uh, that you have to be able to demonstrate and show. I would be very careful about an NDA that's very long. I, I, uh, in terms of the term that you have to keep confidentiality provisions for. I would also be careful about NDAs that have non-competes in them or non-solicits. If it's got anything other than I promise not to say anything, then it's probably something you don't want to do. So what's a reasonable length? Um, I, would I would limit an NDA at this stage literally to ne not necessarily time, but the, just our conversations that we're exchanging. So I wouldn't put a necessarily duration on it. I'd put a subject on it. So Wally, what's your take on that? The, I agree with the subject is the most important thing. Yeah. Um, I usually like to add in a, a six months or a year after this capital. So if someone says five years, in some instances 10 Since, years, that's, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. You don't do that. Absolutely not. It has changed too quickly at that stage of your company. Right. Yeah, but on top of all of it, like, are you going to, like, uh, if, if you're signing an NDA and you're not receiving any compensation for this, you've taken on the burden of needing to remember not to say something the next time you're out. Right. So enforceability of NDAs, big question. Are you going to be taken to court? No, no one's going to actually go to court to do this until it's worth an awful lot of money way downstream. Right. If there's not enough money in the stream, there's not going to be a fight. No one's really going to fight for the sake of fighting. However, you can get the nasty grams, right, that says, hey, you signed an NDA, you're not supposed to do this. And this becomes a headache that you have to deal and how, with. How enforceable is the non-compete or the restrictive covenant? So the non-competes are super interesting. In the state of Colorado, it's best to think of a non-compete really as being based on unfair trade practices. The reason why I ask you to sign a non-compete is because I'm sharing with you specialized information and it would be unfair for you to take that information to a competitor. And so in the realm of keep it confidential because I shared something special with you is where you have the enforceability. So if it's just Arlen is a great guy, he's got a lot of knowledge, I shared with him stuff that inevitably he's going to share with someone else, that would not be enforceable unless you were at the table, a super high-ranking person in the company setting all sorts of direction. You don't want to have someone to come in and, and learn your business model and go, oh, well, we learned his business, let's just take it somewhere else and we'll duplicate it. Now, you're spot on right. And this is why when we think about a non-compete versus confidentiality, the confidentiality pro uh, protections would prevent more of this versus a non-compete. You can't take someone's information that's confidential and share it with others regardless of the purpose for doing so. And so I would definitely, if I'm an advisor, I would probably shy away from the concept of non-compete. And I would actually have the advisor go more toward the confidentiality. Definitely more of that. Non-competes are kind of an iffy thing. If you have an NDA that has a non-compete in it, I think we need to seriously consider what coffee the other party is drinking. Christina, what's the role of trade secrets? And you know this question was coming. So you, you work for a co I work for a company as an advisor whose intellectual property is a trade secret. Not a patent, not a trademark, not a copyright. It's a trade secret. And so if I sign on as an advisor, therefore I promise not to reveal the trade secret, assuming they keep it and all the stuff that goes with it. But that seems to complicate all of this. If you're an advisor, you should not be having access to the trade secret. Here, here. 
Because <laughs> then it's no longer a trade secret, and it would invalidate the trade secret. Part of trade secrets is how, how many people have access to it, how much of it they have access to. Does everybody have access to the whole thing? Do certain people only have access to parts, right? So if you're bringing in an advisor who's not an employee, who's not someone who's there full-time working on this thing, you're really putting your secret at risk by contracting out that secret. And I would, not, and I I would imagine, true. given the software world, that because a lot of software IP protection is either copyright or trade secret, no? It's mostly copyright. Um, the very complicated stuff would be trade secret. And you can actually patent some software. And so interesting point for advisors is if, you're, if, you, if you see this entrepreneur coming up you and saying, look, I've got this great idea, here's my trade secret, you might want to say, well, no, wait, don't tell me that part. I'm not, I'm not helping you if you tell me your trade secret. That's not where the advice goes. This gets back to the scope of the engagement. Can I tell you how I used to handle it? Absolutely. So I was a senior advisor with a bank where we did corporate advice and raised a lot of money for small companies Yes. in Australia. We never signed NDAs, ever. Hmm. We had in the foyer, near the lift, when people were leaving, was a big brass sign. And it said, what you see here, what you hear here, stays here when you leave here. <laughs> like Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I have, and people I have saw that and they knew that we were serious. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. That's a part of the enforceability, and that gets to the protection of trade secrets and copyrights. Uh, absolutely. Let me put that a little bit more, and see if we can't come up with maybe some sample scopes. So, in the advisor agreement, in the advisor relationship, what could possibly, what could possibly go? Um, certainly, uh, maybe my top five anyway. The services are not well defined. I mentioned to you that that's is if there's something that's going to get you in trouble or get you in conflict with who you're serving, it's that you didn't really have a good understanding of what the services were going to be. Second part, you've been paid too much, too much compensation for the advisor, for the value that they got. That is, they made a bad deal. Now, does the court protect you from a bad deal? No, bad deals are enforceable. It's just going to cause conflict. That's what could go wrong from a value I'm in a situation now, small company, they're uh, starting to get much bigger now, they're starting to raise some real money. When they started, they had an advisor on board in the early stage, he was a founder advisor, and uh, he has got maybe 20% of the company in shares now. I haven't seen him for eight years. He hasn't been there, he hasn't done anything for eight years. My client has called me up and said, can you give him a call and just talk with him and, and see maybe how... I'm going to get right on that. But don't you have a vesting schedule for that for the reason? Absolutely. We'll get into that a little bit later. A vesting schedule also, but termination would have been nice, and it would have been nice that they had probably done this before he fully vested. He owns them. He's got 20, 25% of the company, and he's now looking for the current market value price for the money raised in order to get bought out, which would be, you know, at least a quarter of a million to, to $2 million dollars for having done nothing for, for eight years or very little. That's what could go wrong with the compensation side. We don't want to be in that situation. Uh, when does it end? That would be the duration component we were just talking about. about. Let's, let's keep it tighter on the, uh, in the advisory component. Um, finally, the advisor acts like an employee. The advisor actually binds the company, tries to do deals, try to do things that actually implicate uh, or create challenges for the company as well. That is the advisor acting agent of the company. We want to be very careful to stay away from that. I've seen a little bit of that. Uh, no termination right. That's our number one provision, of course. Uh, we want to make sure that we've got very clear termination rights so that if it goes wrong, we can pull the button pretty, we can push the button pretty quickly. I think we should also talk about the difference and the importance of the role. An advisor is a very specific role. It's an advisor. I give you advice. Typically, when you ask me for it, because one of the problems with being an advisor is giving advice when nobody really wants it, and so you, so I, and, and you can take it or leave it. I have no fiduciary responsibility to you. It's entirely up to you whether you want to do what I tell you to do or not. 
as compared to, for example, um, a chief medical officer who's an employee of the company, or more significantly, a member of the board of directors. So if someone asks you to be a, an advisor, that's very different than I want you to be on my board of directors. Because a board person has a specific fiduciary responsibility to the stockholders and the liability. So be very careful what you ask for. And there are all kinds of tax issues and stock issues yeah. and liability issues and all that other stuff. So uh, some people say, oh, I want to be on a board. No, you don't. <laughs> yeah, Not a good is, idea if you really don't know what you're getting yourself into. This is really worth pausing on uh, because you also often hear board of advisors versus board of directors. The board of directors uh, inside of the company, there are very few people that actually have direct liability for things that happen for the company. Board of directors do. You have personal liability if, uh, if you breach your, uh, a couple of the duties that you've got as a, board of, uh, as a director. And as a startup, it was easier for me to get a board of advisors than it is to get a board of directors because they're legally liable for anything. Also, they expect to be compensated as a board. That's right. So, but I, I don't want us to get confused around what a board of advisors does. It, it's a group of people, they're advisors, but they, they don't have like, they don't have a board of director responsibility. They're not really an official board that impacts the company. Yeah. And I've, the, I've received offers to be a director on the board of advisors. That's <laughs> Exactly. That's, that's perfect. Like, what's that about? What does that mean? Right, what, is, what does that mean? Yes. Right. So, yes. so this be very is, careful. That, yeah. That's actually enormously important. The, being a director on the board of advisors, the board of advisors is a non-functioning organization in terms of it doesn't have any fiduciary obligations. But being a director there, and then we start to get into the, well, if you're a director there, you're at the director level and you're using that title, are you bringing that on? Are you taking that responsibility, even though that's not really what was intended? It, uh, that gets really murky. That's a very, very, that's a very good example. This is why we want to make sure that for the scope of work, it's very clear. We don't want to take on any titles <laughs> if we're advisors. We don't want to be given any titles. We don't want to be acting in any title capacity. Um, so, uh, so a scope of work and a sample scope of work might be something like this. We've defined the amount of time that would be the commitment, uh, where you have to be attending a quarterly meetings, attending advisory board meetings, and responsiveness, of course. It's good to set these rules up in the beginning with the entrepreneurs because you'll get calls at odd hours or things that aren't really necessarily scheduled because entrepreneurial work can be sometimes, quite often, um, not fitting into a uh, sort of a normal set of days. Um, the services that you might expect an entrepreneur or an advisor to give um, to help promote the company, right? Um, regular, uh, give insights to uh, the company in its direction, actively promote the company, open up your Rolodex. Uh, and make some connections for us, um, uh, and maybe even uh, you know promoting some of the materials that the company might have. Like I'll go ahead and be a, a great spokesperson for you for this particular group of people. Would it be out of line to have hard numbers? In other words, as an advisor, you need to introduce me to five potential investors, or you need to introduce me to ten new customers. In other words, if he's going to only have five hours, he can sit there and BS for five hours. No, you're spot on right. Are you introducing me to investors? Are you introducing me to potential customers? Yeah, what you're, what you're touching uh, base on here really is the rub between the advisor and what they want to do and what the entrepreneur is looking for. Bless you. The, the metrics around the service goes toward the valuation, right? And this is interesting. From the entrepreneur's perspective, I want five introductions. The quality of them I'm not going to talk about, just to want you to introduce me to five people. From the advisor's perspective, look, I could be giving you five hours of my time. What is the value of a 10-minute phone conversation? In 10 minutes, I introduce you to this person. It's exactly what you're looking for. What's the value of that 10 minutes? And so when we think about the milestones or the metrics that we're utilizing in order to value the service, we should think about the nature of the services that the company provides, the advisor themselves. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll venture to say that advisors are more in the connection space and in the helping you frame an idea, which will save you a bunch of time 
or make an opportunity possible, but less around the metrics of it's got to be five and it's got to be five hours or this. Uh, unless, of course, you're paying for consulting services. But I would avoid the metrics component. You don't hire genius by the hour. Now that, in other words, in, in a lot of advisory situations, you're paying for brand equity of the advisor. You're not paying for FaceTime. You know, Michael Jordan doesn't show up for Nike on every, he's got brand equity. He gets paid because his name is on the sneaker. It's the same deal for many, not all, but many advisory agreements, particularly when it comes to raising money. And that's another problem, which is what I call the I eat what you kill syndrome. So you hire me to connect you to Kelly because I think Kelly wants to invest in your company. Well, once I make that introduction, it's up to you to close the deal. That's not my deal. You, so I'm getting paid if you do your job. I've done mine. But it doesn't help anybody. So what my point is, I think it's a problem when you hire advisors by the hour. Sometimes you have to do that. Otherwise, you simply don't get hired. But you have to factor that into the equation. But I'm saying they'll have this long resume of big companies, icons, you know, right. those that they work for. Right. But then you find out it's been 10 years since they've had any contact with them. And they right. really don't have the people that are there right. to contact or whatever. And I, it's, it's kind of BS. You, well, you're, you're right, but I would also say it's a two-way street. And the two-way street is you get hired as an advisor and you get ghosted. You don't hear from these folks. They hire you. And interestingly, they still pay you, but you don't hear from them. Yes. Like, I'm supposed to participate. Now, you, like this guy, you could say, great, I'm getting paid not doing any work. In my view, the world's a round place, and eventually yes. it's going to come back to bite yes, it you. Does. So yes. I then, as an advisor, will come to you and say, listen, I haven't heard from you in four months. I thought we were going to have like a monthly chat about what's going on then I terminate the agreement. Yes. As the advisor, I terminate the agreement. The world's a round place. It's not to, worth the heartburn. That's you not. don't want to be uh, criticized saying, well, we never heard from our It's advisor. just not right. Okay. You're, you're, you're supposed to add value, and if you're not adding value, then cut it off. This is the key. This is an enormous key. As an advisor, you definitely have to help that entrepreneur group not make their own bad deal with you. Yeah. They're, you their, they're their own worst enemy. They really absolutely are. I've seen this also with the smaller companies that we represent. We do have a subscription base for some of the stuff that we do for them. And if I don't hear from them after some period of time, this isn't working. You're spending money on something that's not creating value for you. We're not giving you a solution that works. We can't, we can't take money for nothing. It's not good for you. Plus, at some point, it's going to come back and say, like, I paid all that money, I didn't get anything. Right. And they're going to they come back. And also, often it comes from confusion. They're just confused. They're really busy and they're fighting little fighters and they don't pay attention to the big stuff. Yep. And sometimes by stepping back, they yes. can just point out that they're not paying attention to the big stuff. Yeah, and absolutely. That their, their company's not functioning right or yeah. something's wrong, you know, it'll help. It's or they're not the ready to hire advisors. Right. That's, they yeah. just simply shouldn't have done it. At that. If yeah. you're heads down trying to get product out the door, you don't want to have me bugging you saying, why don't you do this, do that. You want to get the product out the door. When you start scaling, maybe you need some strategic advice, then let's have a conversation. Yeah. yeah. I think there was a comment in the back. Yes. So a lot of times I have to put educational material almost into the contract so that they can say yes when I ask them to do this. I have several references that have been made to introductions to investors. There's all kinds of SEC implications, but if you do that wrongly, that you know rise to a level of criminal conduct. So. Yeah.
Absolutely. And what, what's so interesting about how contracting are how contracts are morphing in the digital space is that now we have the ability to Im, to uh, to embed video inside of a contract to almost explain what that portion of the contract is as part of a service that we're coming out with here uh, at the end of this week. So um, um, the, the ability to actually explain the contract term as you're getting into it so that you actually know what you're doing, so you can, so you can save time in those kind of components. Absolutely, as advisors, you are absolutely trying to re remove the friction between the service that you provide and the entrepreneur that you're serving. Because I've had advisors, uh, advisors say, well, you need to get more sales. Well, no shit. <laughs> 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 why, don't, why don't you introduce me to five, five customers? But, this falls into this falls the rubric of, well, look, you just need to look at your watch. That's what time it is. <laughs> I, I totally get it. Of course, sometimes that's actually, you know, it's the economy, stupid it's yeah. the thing. Um, uh, but of course, you know, how, how much are you paying for that? You kind of feel whether you're getting the runaround or not. Right. It, it gets back to the scoping exercise. Yeah. One more thing is technology. We're talking about the divorce or the breakup. Yes. Is that, like, I had a friend that was doing about a five or six million dollar deal and, and the person turned out to be a little sketchier than she had assumed. Yes. And both of them had taken part in recording each other as far as um, those are legally admissible and anything you say and do on the phone can and will be used in this Well, it's so interesting. We live in a state where you don't have to have permission for both parties to record the conversation. That's not the case in California. I was doing a negotiation with WellPoint Anthem, with their counsel, and one of our business people was in another room. And while I was in the room speaking with my, my counterpart, uh, I had an open chat line that happened to have turned on the microphone. And all of a sudden, my face just flushed red when I realized that I'm actually recording what we're doing, I'm transmitting it to an unknown third party. That's illegal. That was not great. And if this is being watched by anybody in the state of California, I don't um, uh, so, uh, so it, it is important before you do the recording to understand sort of what state you're in. In the state of Colorado, the law is only one party of the conversation needs to give consent, not everybody. But there are other jurisdictions that have all consent, so it's something to keep in mind. That is that you have to disclose before the recording. And it's always a good idea to disclose. third party cannot do it. Like if there's two people talking and you're recording yeah. them, that's yeah. probably illegal. Yeah, it just has to, you just have to have disclosure. You only need consent in the state of Colorado from one person for the recording. So if a third party is recording, uh, and well, here's an example, right? We're recording everything that we're doing here. Uh, you only need consent from one party or one person inside of you. You don't need everybody's consent, um, which is kind of interesting. That would be kind of an interesting thing to think about for, for all of this. We've got other proprietary rights with regard to images and things like that. You're going to need to quit in five minutes. Yeah. No. Well, if that's the case, then let me get right to five minutes. Okay, we were talking about compensation. I did want to sp speak briefly about compensation and, and fast-talking lawyers. That's really what you want to go for. Uh, so compensation typically comes in either cash or in shares, as Arnold had mentioned also. And even of the shares and the types of uh, compensation around shares, options are becoming quite uh, also attractive, right? Like I'm giving you the option to buy shares later. Options can be useful to avoid tax consequences, right? Because you don't really have anything until you exercise the option. 83B is a good term to talk with your financial advisor about uh, in general. Receiving shares beginning is kind of a risky bit of business for the advisor, receiving shares and giving shares. Options are a good way to go. Options, I think, are a good way to go because there is an exchange of consideration, but you purchase the, option, you, you purchase the shares later. You actually get control of the shares later. So that kind of defers the compensation. Do you pay taxes on the, com the stocks that you would get up front? You do, well, that's the 83B election component, but yes, it depends on the value of those shares. Usually in the beginning, they're not worth a whole lot, right? I've got a $3 million valuation. I'm giving you a percentage of my company. That's what we think it is. If you do the 83B election, you can defer some of the tax consequences until they actually come into the money. However, uh, taking shares up front is something that, uh, that does drive a tax consequence, and I would definitely have advisors, uh, as well as companies, talk to, to tax professionals before doing that. Options can avoid that conversation for a bit. Uh, payable over a vesting period. We talked a little bit about the vesting period. It's pretty important. So the, the question always comes up is, I'm being offered options. What's a fair offer? 
as an advisor. Yes. And my understand and just my experience is a it depends on what you're being hired to do. It depends on how much work you're being asked to to, to do. Yeah. Um, and it's typically and it's typically going to be about a half percent to five percent if you're on the board. Um, so it really depends on what the situation of the company is and what you're willing to accept because it's all negotiable and all that business. Yeah. And, and the vesting period and all that business. So yeah. bottom line, talk to somebody, financial advisor, accountant, lawyer, so you understand what you're getting yourself into. In terms of framework, I found this chart to be pretty useful for both parties because it does talk about sort of level of effort, stage of company. And so if it's an early stage company and the level of effort is super heavy expert level, you can probably get more than 1%. It does go up a little bit higher than that. If it is a growth stage company, they've already got their ideas worked out. They need you for something super narrow as an advisor. Then it's going to typically be less. We do, take, we do speak about percentages of shares in the beginning. Like I'm going to give you 1% of all of my shares of the company. It's just easier for the math. The reality is it's going to translate to some number of shares or some number of options. I would take a look at the valuation of the company, the level of effort, and I would also take a look at, um, at certainly the stage of where the company is in order to kind of get a feeling of what the value of the shares might be and what your time obviously is worth. You can't take a whole bunch of uh, advisory positions where you're an expert, 1% of these companies, and they're not yielding any cash or there's no, really, there's no way to come out of it. So, and it depends um, on if you're in a private company. Again, if you're on a board of a private company versus a public company, much different. The average salary of a public board of director is $43,600, but the average compensation per board meeting is $2,573. I know that because they just published these numbers. Of course it's going to be different if you're in a startup. So it just depends on the situation. All right. Last piece is, of course, lack of knowledge increases the cost of transactions, both for the advisor as well as for the company. So understanding what it is that you want out of the relationship before you start this is uh, just sort of the basic key. So um, you've got an, evalu uh, an advisor agreement or a template. You've not done this before. You don't know how to evaluate it. This is the problem where they've just plopped over to you a 17-page document. What's the best way to do this? This is where what we do comes in and comes in handy. Contracts RX has produced uh, models, essentially, for contracts. We have a model for advisor agreements that helps you evaluate the contract and then score it to kind of see where it would land in terms of a normal or what you'd expect out of, a, out of an advisor agreement for the situation that you're in. This is uh, something that we produce on, on our website. Please look for one of us afterward and love to give you access to it uh, if you have advisor agreements. The trick with advisor agreements is that you just don't do them all that often. And so they tend to be expensive agreements because it takes a lot of time. You don't do it all that often. That's where models and understanding, just a guide to get through it, makes things cheaper, makes it really faster to go through. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Great Thank job. You. Thank you. Yeah. So we have time for one or two more questions.